a few days ago, I posted a game in which I got my opponent into a really nasty Zugzwang position, uh, link below. But if you're not familiar with Zugzwang, it's a type of position in chess where basically you're completely stuck and you have to self-destruct. And it's most common in the endgame, but there are cases where you can get into Zugzwang in the middle game. And in this video, I want to share probably the most famous Zugzwang in chess history. And this is a game that was played about exactly 100 years ago. Actually, I have to give credit to international master Junta Ikeda. I saw a tweet from him yesterday, uh, basically celebrating the 100th anniversary of this game. Uh, it was played between Aaron Nimzovich uh, with black pieces against Frederick Zamish. And this is known as the Immortal Zugzwan game, and we're going to see why. But uh, let's get into it. It was played, I believe, March 9th, 2023. Maybe March 10th. I've seen conflicting, um, conflicting information online. But it started with a very classical opening. Queen's Pawn going into a Queen's Indian. Zamish played g3. This is still a topical opening a uh, hundred years later, um, featured in many Grandmaster games. And they went into a, a pretty solid line. Not too much to say about this, kind of transposed into a Queen's Gambit decline setup. Both sides have relatively nice piece harmony. And White played a move here in 95, which makes a ton of sense. This is very typical, especially with the Fianchetto Bishop, to create the pin along the long diagonal. And I've played similar setups as black, and I've found these positions to be a little bit uncomfortable just because white has more space, a bit more activity. But we're going to see how Nimzovich copes with this, uh, starting with c6, just reinforcing d5. And after takes, takes bishop f4. Yeah, here it looks like white has a slight edge, just happier pieces. This bishop is a little bit sad on b7. Uh, but I really, really like the way that Nimzovich uh, kind of approached the next few moves because he had a very clear plan in mind, uh, which basically started with his next move, pawn a6. And the point of this move, it kind of looks a little bit slow, looks like a waiting move, but the eventual plan is to expand with b5 and then maneuver the knight to c4. And it's a very typical plan in this sort of opening for black to kind of make some headway on the queen side. Uh, white responded with rook c1, uh, pawn b5 was played, queen b3, and then knight to c6. And from here, white made the first mistake of the game. White went ahead and took the knight on c6, perhaps fearing this maneuver. Uh, knight a5 would get tempo on the queen. Also, the d4 pawn is attacked, so white does have to address this threat. Now, it does turn out that white had a stronger approach now, I've seen this game covered throughout the years. I know there's a lot of videos uh, featuring this game on YouTube, but I haven't seen the possibility for white mentioned in this position until right before starting the recording. I was looking through with Stockfish, and Stockfish actually recommends a really, really cool move for white that leads to just immense complications. Uh, the move knight takes d5. Now, it's important to note that Stockfish did not exist 100 years ago or even, what, like 20 years ago? So um, it didn't really have the influence on the, the classical games. Now, this would have led to a flurry of trades because after knight takes d5, the point is white's hitting the knight on c6. So if black takes back uh, either way, then the knight will be lost on c6. But black can respond with knight takes d4. And then it's just a mess where so many things are attacked, queens attacked, knights attacked many different ways. White would have to play um, knight takes e7 or knight f6 here. Knight e7 would be preferable. And then uh, this was the extent of my analysis with Stockfish, where the engine says white has a slight edge, but I think anything can still happen from here. But let me show what happened in the game, because white took on c6. And this is somewhat of a positional mistake, because white made one, two, three moves with this knight just to trade it off. So white's essentially losing time, and black is still happy to uh, recapture. And even though this bishop still looks sad, we're going to see how black continues to improve. Uh, white played h3 here after queen d7, king h2. 
it became clear that White's not really playing with a plan. Like these moves are not too impressive. And it's actually not easy for White to find a clear plan here. Like Black is actually really, really solid. And it's not clear how White really makes meaningful progress or even improves things in a meaningful way. Uh, so the next several moves, we're gonna see Black really just improving and expanding the position while White essentially just doesn't know what to do. Uh, next move was really nice, knight h5, hitting the bishop and also making way for the f-pawn to move forward. Bishop d2 is played, and after f5, black is just expanding, and white played a sad move here, queen to d1, going all the way back to the starting square. Now, this move was played with intention to target the knight on h5, but after pawn to b4, white is still having to retreat. Uh, knight b1 played. And then bishop to b5. So white really wants to move the pawn to hit the knight, but now the pawn is pinned to the rook. So white played the move rook g1. And if we just look at the setup of white's pieces, like literally everything is just super passive. And uh, black is having all the fun, puts the bishop on d6. And then here white played a really interesting move. And this move was played with good intention, pawn to e4. At first, this move looks really powerful because it's um, it's preparing pawn e5, but it's also hitting the undefended knight on h5. But it's very clear that Nimzovich was prepared for this move, and he played just a brilliant reply, simply taking the pawn, losing the knight, but then winning f2. So the position transforms where black is now down a minor piece, down a knight for two pawns. But white's position is just miserable. And uh, the position becomes even more difficult for white to play after queen g5, rook a f8, black is continually improving, king h1 getting off the alignment of the rook and the bishop. But after rook f5, queen e3, bishop d3, black pieces are kind of acting as a boa constrictor just tying down white from all directions. And after rook ce1, we are approaching the famous position because here black played one more move and Zamish resigned. And there's actually probably a few, um, or probably many winning moves for black, but uh, the move that was played was just brutal. Nimzovich unleashed pawn h6, a very simple waiting move. And it turns out that white is just completely, completely stuck. And basically everything that white does from this position will get punished in some way. And this is the immortal Zugzwang position after 25 moves, uh, Nimzovich won the game. And I wanna go through like every single piece for white and show why nothing can move. First of all, the knight is completely dominated. Uh, only two legal moves would uh, result in pawn takes knight. The bishop can't move forward. These squares are covered. If it moves backward, it cuts off the rook. So bishop c1 would just lose the knight on b1. If we move on to this rook, uh, f1 is covered, covered three times by the rook battery and the bishop. Can't move to e2. And if it moves to d1 or c1, that moves away from the e2 square, black would then have rook e2 trapping the white queen. So this rook is completely tied down essentially to covering e2. This rook has one legal move, but it would just blunder material. And uh, this bishop also just doesn't have any squares to go to. Now you may ask, what about the king and the pawns? Uh, if the king moves, let's say to only legal move to h2, then it walks into the pin. The bishop is now pinned, which allows rook five to f3, trapping the white queen on e3. So the king stuck on h1. If the pawn moves to g4, this opens up a really nice tactic, essentially opens up the diagonal. So now that the bishop has scope to the h2 square, black has a similar idea, rook f3, again, trapping the queen. Now, if the bishop takes, it's checkmate in one, rook h2. So g4 is not playable. And with the remaining pawn moves, pawn h4, pawn b3, pawn a3, black can simply keep waiting. 
Now, if pawn a3, just a5, takes, takes, nothing really changes. If pawn b3, black can keep waiting. Pawn h4, black just keeps waiting. Maybe just move the king back and forth. And um, eventually white is in complete paralysis. And again, for all the reasons that I've addressed, there's no moves. And if we go back to the position in which white resigned after pawn h6, the modern engine very much confirms that white is toast here. Engine gives uh, about minus eight in black's favor. It says that white will eventually have to play bishop c1 and lose a knight and just eventually lose everything. So I thought this was a really cool game to share. I really hope that people enjoyed this analysis. And I am thinking about starting a series of videos where I share games that I think every chess player should know. So let me know if you want to see more content like this. Let me know if you want to see any games uh, specifically to cover. And be sure to subscribe to stay tuned for more content. And I'll see you guys soon.